at the end of the first Christian century on the very far eastern boundary of the Roman Empire that bordered the Parthian Empire, Rome was doing something that no one really understood exactly to this day what she was attempting to do. She was in the largest building program in her history, building what we know today as the temples of Baalbek. Now, I don't know if you've ever read anything about that, studied anything about that, but Rome was quarrying marble all the way down into Egypt, floating it up the Nile, bringing it up the coastline of the Mediterranean, and then hauling it over in, in close to the Bekaa Valley, building a platform that was 5 million square feet uh, of space. And on top of that, building the three largest temples that Rome ever built. She built, not in Rome, but now all the way over here in what we know today is the land of Lebanon. And there in that place, she built a temple to uh, Jupiter, Zeus, the god who was uh, the head of all the gods, the god of power, uh, and uh, a temple to the goddess of Eros, the goddess of erotica, of pornea, of uh, all kind of uh, sex, and then the god Bacchus, the god of alcohol. Those three temples were built there. They were left unfinished. She didn't quite finish all of that. They're called the unfinished temples of Baalbek. But she built those, and nobody really to this day, it's kind of like a riddle wrapped up in uh, a mystery that is cloaked in an enigma. What in the world was she doing? Why was Rome spending this kind of resource in finances and in manpower to build these temples on the very edge of her empire? Well, I think there is an answer to that if you've got your copy of God's Word in uh, Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 14, 15, and 16, really 13, 14, 15, and 16. If you've got a Bible this morning, I hope you'll turn and look with me in these passages as I try to be faithful to the Word of God and faithful to the assignment that you've given me. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. It's always wonderful to be here. You're so gracious. We love this place. We love your school. We love your faculty, Dr. Nix. It's humbling to have to stand and try to preach in front of you. Um, and um, thank you for the Christian educators that are here for giving me this opportunity. And so I want to do what you've asked me to do. I want to take you to this passage. I'm not going to be in just one simple little pericope here. You've you got to give me a little leeway this morning to do what you've asked me to do. So if you're there, what in the world were they doing? What was, what was Rome attempting to do? This is what I think she was doing. She was attempting to counter what was happening in a city just to the west of Baalbek because something was happening there. There was a belief there. There was a worldview that was uh, being shared there. Uh, there was something going on in this place called Antioch uh, that Rome wanted to stop. Rome wanted to counter what was taking place in the church in Antioch. It was from Antioch, it was out of that church that uh, there would come a belief system, there would come a worldview, uh, there would begin a mission program that Rome could not stop and that would eventually bring down the Roman Empire and change the world as anyone and everyone knew it. And I think that's part of what Rome was doing. She was attempting to counter what was taking place in the church there in Antioch. And what were they doing there? Well, lo and behold, they were doing one thing. They were making disciples. Now, for some reason, we don't have that kind of impact in our day. I've just come back from about 15 days in Greece and through the Greek Isles and in Turkey. And uh, I stood in Ephesus with a group that I was leading and literally became emotional when I thought about the fact that they filled that amphitheater. There was nothing like it. Seats about 24, 25,000 people that they, they packed that place out and for two hours they stood there and at the top of their lungs they screamed, great is um, Artemis of the Ephesians, great is Diana of the Ephesians, 
Artemis, Diana. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians for two hours. And I came under such conviction. When was the last time I preached the gospel so clearly that the city of Jacksonville stood in front of the mayor's office and screamed, we will worship our God? It's been a long time since we've had a right from somebody preaching. Uh, and for some reason, we have lost that sense of passion that Paul obviously had and that they had there in the church at Antioch. And uh, we've lost that because of something I call missional drift. We've just drifted from our mission. You ask the average Baptist church, what is your mission? And they'll give you everything in the world but to win people to Jesus Christ and to disciple people in Christ. Back in the late 1890s, the industry that ruled America was the railroad. There was nothing that could touch it. There was financial power, there was uh, real estate power, there was political power, but something happened about that time that buckled the knees of the great railroad industry that dominated uh, the American scene, and it was something that was called the horseless carriage. And Henry Ford had an idea and a way to make that thing so available and so affordable that everybody began to turn to the automobile. And if you'd asked the railroad, what was your mission, what is your purpose, the railroad would have said, it is to lay rail across this country. And she forgot her mission. It was not to lay rail. It was to transport people. And so she had a missional drift and it nearly bankrupt, and it did to a great extent, the railroad industry. Same thing happened in the mid-19 or late 1960s and into the 1970s to 1980. In 1968, the Swiss watch manufacturing division owned 65% of the world's business in making watches. And she generated 90% profit from the world in making and selling watches. The Swiss had done everything with the watch. They made the minute hand. They made it waterproof. Uh, they made the self-winding watch. Do you know the Swiss even invented and came up with the concept of the quartz? And they looked at the quartz and they said, no, if you use a quartz, you don't use a mainspring. And from 1968 to 1980, in 12 years, 62,000 watchmakers in Switzerland, 50,000 lost their job, and in 1980 only had 10% of the world market of watches because some people from Japan by the name of Seiko came in and took the quartz and started making watches. Because the Swiss forgot they were not in the mainspring business, they were in the watchmaking business. Missional drift. Same thing with Eastman Kodak. Eastman Kodak got in her mind that she was no longer in the photography business, but we're in the business of making little yellow boxes with film. And now Eastman Kodak is no longer. She missed the digital revolution because of missional drift. You go into the average Baptist church and say, what is your mission? Our mission is to see that we still use the hymn books that we bought 50 years ago on Sunday morning. Well, yeah, there's, you, you wonder why our churches are dying? Because we've got it in our head. That's our mission. Our mission is that they will not move my Sunday school class for any reason whatsoever. That's our mission in this church. You walk in the average Baptist church and ask them, what is your mission? They will give you everything under the sun except for reaching people for Jesus Christ and discipling people in Jesus Christ. And an amen should go right there from everybody. What in the world is that? We have missional drift. Now let me tell you something. Discipleship keeps and guards a church against missional drift. Now I've got two points. It's almost bad this. It's not three, but it's two points. So uh, go to the text with me, chapter 15, and look at what we rarely look at, and that's the beginning of the second missionary journey. The only thing we really know about the beginning of the second missionary journey is that Paul and Barnabas fell into a fight with one another. And that's basically it. That, we know that. We really pick it up with Paul leaving Troas and going over to uh, Philippi and uh, taking the gospel to the west. But I want to take you back to a little section here 
in Acts chapter 15, and I want you to look at this with me. I want to show you two things. First of all, I want you to see this. I want you to understand that discipleship impacts the culture of the church. Now, let, let me say that again. Discipleship impacts the culture of the church. Your church has a culture. Um, and uh, most likely, it needs something to shake it up. Well, that's exactly what Paul is going to do when he goes back to these churches uh, that they had already gone. We remember chapter 13 where the Holy Spirit says, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. They take off, they go to Paphos, they go to uh, Cyprus, they go to Pamphylia, they go to Perga, uh, they go to Pisidian, Antioch, they go to Derbe and Lystra and Iconium. They go to all these places, preach the gospel, uh, the church springs up in these places, and uh, they come back, and in a little while, verse 36 of chapter 15, Paul said to Barnabas, let's return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Let's go back. Let's go back and do some discipleship. Now, we're not told that the Holy Spirit put this in Paul's heart. I'm sure he did. We're just not told that. We're not told that... Uh, uh, that there was some voice that they heard, but this was something that Paul knew needed to be done. They needed to go back and disciple uh, these new believers in Jesus Christ. And that was his heart, and that's what he wanted to do. Now, what is he going to do? Well, through this passage, there are three things I want you to see that Paul's going to do as he goes back. Now, just hold on. We'll get to the separation of the two uh, in a little bit. But he's going to go back and he's going to do three things that just stand out in this whole episode. Number one, there is the process of education uh, by edification. Now, not all education is edifying. I've learned lessons in life that uh, I did not enjoy the experience. I didn't like the way I was taught. I've had some. I've had people in my in the ministry. I've had people in life take me to school. Anybody ever taken you to school? Yeah. And uh, did you learn a lesson? Yeah. Was it a wonderful experience? No. It was the opposite of that. We've all had it. Listen, our education should be built on edification. It should be a building up. Every time you come across the word edification in the New Testament. It has the root oikos, which is house, and it means this concept of building up. It's organized, it's thoughtful, it's progressive, it is intentional. There is this education that must be done in edification, building up the people. Well, that's what Paul's going to do. He's going to go back through these churches. Now, watch this. Let me show you something. Go back, if you will, to chapter 14. How is he going to do this education? In uh, chapter 14, verse 21, after they had preached the gospel to the city and had made many disciples, do you see that? They've made many disciples. They returned to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples. That's the first time you see that. Now, get over to chapter 15, verse 41, and you read, he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, Cilicia strengthening the churches. That's the second time. Look in chapter 16. You've got it 14, 15, 16. Chapter 16, listen to what's said in verse 5. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith. Three times that is stated. That Paul was doing this when he went in. He was making disciples. And what was he doing in making disciples? He was educating them. And that educational process was strengthening. That's a medical term. If you go all the way back to Acts chapter 3, when Peter and John go up to the temple, they see this lame beggar that is there. You know the story. Peter seizes him by the right hand in chapter 3, verse 7, and raises him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. The word there is sterizo, episterizo. And uh, the concept is when that man who was lame stood up, something in his ankles with the muscles, with the tendons, with the ligaments, all of a sudden, somehow, miraculously, all of that came together, knitted together in some kind of way that enabled him not just to stand up, 
but could bear all of the weight of his body on ankles that had never had the strength to do that before. And so when Paul goes through these churches making these disciples, what he's doing is he's taking the word of God and he's strengthening them so that these new believers can stand up on new legs and bear the weight of whatever is going to place down on them. Whatever's going to come down on them, they're able to stand in that kind of way. That's exactly what discipleship is doing. It is taking the Word of God and it is strengthening. If you don't think that will not impact your church culture, you haven't thought about it very long. You begin to do that. You begin to take the Word of God and you go deliberately and purposefully to, to build up other people with God's word and they begin to get strong to stand up under the issues of life and it will change the culture of your church. The second thing is encouragement. Not just education, but encouragement. It gives us this. If you go back to chapter 14 and verse 22, it says when he went back through these churches, what he was doing was strengthening the souls of the disciples and encouraging them. He was encouraging them. Now, let me tell you what had come in. Something had come in to discourage all of them. When they got back to Antioch, they discovered that there were these Judaizers that had come in. The Judaizers had come in, and they were beginning to tell all these Gentile Christians, well, you've got to be circumcised, and uh, you're going to have to follow some of this dietary law of Moses and some of these rituals that are here. In other words, you Gentiles are going to have to become Jews in order to be able to be saved by a Jewish Messiah. And Barnabas and Paul get back and they react to this. And they say, hey, wait a minute. We're all saved by grace. We don't understand what you're in here talking about, but we can tell you this isn't right. So they all go off down to Jerusalem. You know the story. I don't have to go through all of that. There in Jerusalem, they come out with, and if you look at this, uh, in chapter 16, when he comes to these churches, we're told they were delivering the decrees. That's the word in the Greek. It's dogma. Lord, they taught doctrine. Can you imagine? They gave them doctrine. They gave them the word of God, which had been decided upon by the apostles and the elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. And it wasn't horrible. It was an encouraging experience. To teach your people the word of God is not drudgery. I'm telling you, I'd rather do it than eat. And I enjoy eating. It is wonderful to take the Word of God. The best way I know to encourage somebody is to give them the Word of God. That's exactly what Paul was doing here. He went into these churches and he began to encourage them. Look at chapter 15, verse 31. When they had read it, that is, that dogma, what they had received from the apostles in Jerusalem, they rejoiced. The people were happy because of its encouragement. I had a guy, I had an unusual experience on this trip. I had a guy go with me. I really didn't know who he was. Well, I had a lot of folks go with me. I didn't know who they were, but this guy slipped up and he said, could I have dinner with you and Miss Debbie one night? And I said, well, sure. We'd love for you to come and sit and have dinner. And so the next night we sat out at a table um, uh, on the back of the ship and we were eating dinner. And uh, he said, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. He said, I drive up from Sarasota, Florida, Dr. Kelly, every couple of Sundays. I said, good night, you gotta be kidding me. He said, no, he said, I'll leave the house at five o'clock in the morning. It's a four hour drive. He says, I drive up in time to get there to go to Sunday school and from Sunday school to preaching. And he said, I just mess around Jacksonville for the afternoon until it's time to come back to church on Sunday night. I, I, got, I got deacons that don't come back on Sunday night. Huh? Amen. And this guy from Sarasota hangs out in the city of Jacksonville all day to come back to church on Sunday night until service is over and he gets in his car and he drives back four hours to Sarasota uh, and he gets home after midnight. And he told me that. This guy grew up in Jack Howell's church and um, went to Jack Howell's college and graduated with a degree in Bible and uh, was in ministry for a while and that very successful bit very successful businessman 
I asked him why he didn't just move to Jacksonville. He said, listen, I own a string of condominiums down there, and I'm there, and I've got to see over my business that's there. But he said, I want to be able to come up on an every Sunday basis. And I said, what in the world did that? He said, one Sunday after church, I came to the receiving line, and you and your wife and the other folks that were out there, Steve's out there, he said, you all made me feel so welcomed that I decided it was worth a four-hour drive on Sunday mornings to come to First Baptist Church of Jacksonville. You know, if he'd have said, I, I cannot miss your preaching one time, he didn't say that. He didn't say the music is so incredible, I've got to be there. This is what he said. I am so encouraged by the people that I don't want to miss a Sunday. There are people that are desperately in need of encouragement. Many of you are sitting right here, and you need some encouragement in ministry. That's part of discipleship. Don't miss it, but the third part is this. It's evangelism. Now, I don't know why, but for some reason, we seem to divorce or separate or put off evangelism and discipleship and say, well, you do evangelism, then you do discipleship. Listen, let me tell you something. If you don't evangelize somebody and lead them to the Lord, you're not going to have anybody to disciple. Very much a part of this whole thing of discipleship is evangelism, and I'm going to tell you, and I say this from a pastor's heart, I don't say this to be harsh, but let me tell you something. Discipleship devoid of evangelism breeds arrogance. And you sit around for the next 20 years, we're going to disciple each other. Now, I'm, I'm, and it doesn't make it one bit of a difference. I know this isn't popular among younger pastors today. I am a pre-trib uh, premillennialist. That's what I am. And that, that's fine. If you don't have to be, listen, if you want to hang out here through the tribulation, knock yourself out. <laughs> it's all right with me. I'm going to be with Jesus. We'll see you when you get there. <laughs> now, you can, for the next 30 years, sit around and disciple each other in this whole issue. Now, I'm saying this because this is what I, of premillennialism, pre trib. And, and you'll just reaffirm and reaffirm and reaffirm for the next 30 years and never, never help anybody else get to heaven. Or you can sit around and you can talk about how you're the elect for the next 30 years and never go out and share with somebody and find out if somebody else is elect. So discipleship, void of evangelism, breeds arrogance, folks. The best way I know to cut down on your feeling arrogant about your salvation is go share Jesus Christ with somebody. Now that's what he said. I get, I get, you said, well, show me that in the text. Good, thank you. Let me show you. Chapter 16, verse 5. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith. They were increasing in number daily. That is, people were coming to Christ. They had somebody to disciple. You can go all the way back to chapter 6. And you read this in Acts. Chapter 6 and verse 7, the word of God kept on spreading and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. Look at chapter 9 and verse 31. You're going to read it again. It says, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace being built up, going on in the fear of the Lord and comfort of the Holy Spirit. It continued to increase. Chapter 12, verse 24 comes and says, but the word of the Lord continued to grow and be multiplied. And then chapter 16, verse 5, increasing in number daily. It's just saying it again and again and again. Go tell them about Jesus. 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 Then disciple them was sitting on that ship early in the morning getting ready um, for my morning devotions. I was the first one in. Uh, it was uh, 5.30 maybe in the morning, and uh, I, had, I had a travel Bible that I always took because it had wide margins that I could write notes in the margins. It's about this size or a little smaller and had a leather case with a thong that you could wrap around it and tie it up. And um, I had it out. I always traveled with it, made notes in it. I had it there, and I looked up when an officer on the ship stopped by. He was Turkish, which meant he was Muslim. And uh, he, felt, reached, he reached down, and he felt it, and he said, Boy, that's a nice book. I said, Do you like that? And he said, I do. I said, Well, listen, 
let me unwrap it and show you because what's inside is better than what's on the outside. And I opened the Word of God to the Gospel of John and I gave him a brief introduction to the Gospel. Told him that Jesus was the Son of God that died for, his, for him. And I said, can you read English? And he said, yes. I said, I'm going to turn to the Gospel of John and mark it. I want you to read it. And I gave it to him. And he said, you're giving me this? And I said, yes, it's yours. And he took it and he held it in his hands like this. And he just felt it. And then he opened it and he said, but you've got notes in here. I said, read the notes too. <laughs> they're, they're, they're almost as good as the other stuff. Not quite. <laughs> almost as good. I said, read those too. He took it. I didn't see him for a day. The next day I saw him. And I caught him for just a moment because they're kind of strict on these guys. And uh, I looked at him and I said, hey, can you tell me, have you read the Gospel of John? He said, I read it last night. I said, well, go back and read it again. Now, that's the last I've seen of him. But somewhere on a boat in the Aegean Sea right now is a Turkish officer on that boat who's got a copy of the Word of God and he's reading the Gospel of John. Man, that's important. It's important that we share the gospel. That changes the culture of your church. You start getting your people to talk to people about Jesus Christ, that will change your church culture quicker than anything I know of. Now let me give you the second thing. And the second thing is this. Is that discipleship enables your church to impact its culture. It enables your church to impact the culture wherever your church happens to be. Now, let me take you now to what's going to take place in verse 37. And in verse 37, Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with them also. And Paul kept insisting, just on and on and on. They talked about this, obviously, that they should not take him along because he deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Now, I don't know where that's all we're told. I, I don't know if it got really bad between the two of them, uh, but let me just say this. Um, at, at this point in my life, I've watched men that I've admired and love, even to this day, who have differed on issues, um, and uh, I've not fallen to pieces because my heroes, one believed this, one believed another. If you keep your eyes on Christ, you do a whole lot better. And so these two men, these two giants disagreed. Now, you see, when we come to this, we automatically just, we're going to take a side. You know what? Barnabas passes off the pages of the New Testament. Obviously, that, he, he was wrong on this. Paul, the, you know, we're told about Paul. Well, listen, that was just the work of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't that Barnabas was wrong and Paul was right or Paul was wrong and Barnabas was right. In fact, watch the hand of God in all. You want to talk about the sovereignty of God? Watch the sovereignty of God in this thing. There's a sharp disagreement. Peroxentai is the word. Our word peroxide comes from it. You cut your finger, you pour peroxide on it, it bubbles up. There was this bubbling up of disagreement here. Both godly men, but what's going on? What's happening? What's taking place here? Both these men are still going to impact their culture. They're passionate about this. Paul happens to be passionate about the mission. Barnabas happens to be passionate about the man. That which one is right and which is wrong? I can't say. Is the mission more important than the man or is the man more important than the mission? I think it has to do with who they were, who God created them to be, where their hearts were. Paul was consumed with this mission. Barnabas was always consumed and concerned about putting his arm around somebody and loving them and leading them. So they split. Here's the wisdom and the sovereignty of God in this. Uh, Barnabas takes off. He takes Mark and he sails away to Cyprus. He takes this next generation guy and he sails off to his homeland and there he's going to preach the gospel. He is passionate about pouring himself into Mark, but he's also passionate about taking the gospel. Here's Paul. Paul takes Silas. He takes off with Silas, and they head on out, and look in verse 1 of chapter 16. They come to Derby and to Lystra, 
and a disciple was there. There was a young guy there named Timothy who was a disciple already. Now, Barnabas goes off one direction. Paul goes off the other direction. Look, look, you know what God's done? He's taken one team, and now he's divided it to where he's got two teams that are going out. And both these old guys have got younger guys with them. Barnabas takes Mark, who gave up, who quit, who went back, who wouldn't do the work, and he obviously poured himself into this young kid, so much so that when Barnabas dies, Mark is passed off to Peter. And he follows Peter, and the gospel of Mark is basically the preaching of Peter. Now, let's, let me ask you a question. Who do you think was easier to get along with, Barnabas or Peter? Barnabas had so trained and discipled and equipped this young man that he could hang with a rough fisherman like Peter. And God would use him to write a gospel. Now what about old Paul? You know where Paul goes back? He goes back to Lystra. Do you remember what happened to Paul at Lystra? Some of y'all hesitant about going back to your church. Well, I got a lady back there, and she's, she's been after me, and she just will not leave me. She's just fussing and upset and everything. Has she stoned you and left you for dead? <laughs> Paul went back to the place that stoned him and left him for dead. Now, until it gets that bad, you can debate it. He goes back there. And lo and behold, there's a disciple there. I almost wonder if the day that Paul was stoned, Timothy didn't watch the stoning of Paul. The way Paul, Saul, had watched the stoning of Stephen. And after the stoning of Stephen, he gets on a road to Damascus and his life changes. And there Timothy, watching them stone Paul, I wonder if something happened in his life that day. And Paul picks him up. And both these older men take younger men and pour themselves into the next generation, disciple them so that one writes the gospel and one becomes this great church leader. They impact their culture by discipleship. They impact the next generation. And you say, but how did they have the ability to do this? They had one thing. They had a passion to get off the sideline and in the game. Do you know, on the way here, I was reading a book, Pat, uh, it, and it was quoting Patton on leadership. You know, do you know Patton's number one leadership principle? Make a decision. And we talk about discipleship. Well, we're going to do it. And we're going to study it. But I've got to go off to another seminar. And I'm going to have to go up and see this guy. And then I'm going to have to call five or six people. I'm going to have to do Make a decision. Maybe that's why God's got you here this morning, this week, these few days, to bring you to the point to where you just say, I'm going to start. Make a decision and start the discipleship program that you know you need to do. You do it. You go get two or three guys. Or you go get two or three ladies, ladies, and you begin to pour into them what God has already put into you. Get off the pew, get into the game. Have a passion to do that. 1954, Cotton Bowl, Alabama Rice. It became known as the most uh, unusual play in college football. There was a running back for Rice. By the way, Alabama also got beat that year, just like they did this last year by Clemson. Look, don't, don't hate on me now. You see it right there, Dickie Magel? Run that back, guys, and let them see that. Run that one more time. Down on the, down on the five-yard line right here, there goes Dickie Magel right there. He'd already scored once on Alabama. Amen. And he's coming up the sideline to do it again. 95 yards he's going to sprint until something happens right about here 
off the sideline. Tommy Lewis for Alabama. That's the way they play ball in Alabama. <laughs> off the sideline. Tommy Lewis comes into the game, tackles Dickie Magel. Dickie said it knocked the breath out of him. He said, I couldn't move. He said, I couldn't get up and go after him if I wanted to. Tommy Lewis runs back to the sideline. What you probably did not notice is he gets back to the sideline and he ducks down behind the other guys so as nobody would see him. Of course, they caught him. They gave Rice the touchdown. They gave that to uh, Dickie Magel that day, who, by the way, goes on to place for the 49ers and the Cowboys. He ran 265 yards that day. They beat Alabama 28-6. Listen, Jesus died for people in Alabama, too. Amen. I just want you to know that. But did you see that? Ed Sullivan called both those boys up to New York, put them on television right after that. Dickie Magel was there. Tommy Lewis was there. Ed Sullivan interviewed the two of them. And they looked over, finally, Ed Sullivan did, and he said to Tommy Lewis, what in the world were you thinking to get up off that bench and run out there and tackle uh, Dickie may go like that. And Tommy Lewis, good old southern boy, said this, well, I guess I was just too full of Bama. Too full of Bama. It's time we get full of Jesus and get off the sideline and into the game. Would you stand and let me pray with us? Now, your head's bowed. Let me just ask you in this moment. Isn't it time you got off the sideline and into the game? Isn't it time that we all get serious about this very important thing that Jesus told us to do? Go, therefore, into the whole world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all things isn't it time we start doing that in the church again maybe if we start doing that in the church again it will change the culture of the church and the church can take the gospel into the culture and change the world father you have given us all we need we don't need more technology we don't need larger libraries we don't need greater resources. We don't even need more money. All we need to do is to be faithful to what you've called us to do. Help us, Lord Jesus, all of us, myself included, to get off the sideline and into the game. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.